matter I'm calling is uh, State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez, D101CR 202340. Party state their name. Uh, Carrie Morrissey and Jason Lewis on behalf of the State of New Mexico. Good morning, Your Honor. Jason Bowles and Carmela Cisneros are here for Ms. Gutierrez Reed, who is also present. All right, thank you. All right, this is a sentencing. Let's proceed. Um, let's get the microphone on. Uh, Your Honor, I, I wasn't sure exactly what recommendation would be appropriate in this unprecedented case until last week when I completed the review of Ms. Gutierrez's jail calls. Uh, it was my sincere hope during this process that there would be some moment when Ms. Gutierrez took responsibility, um, expressed some level of remorse that was genuine, and that moment has never come. Ms. Gutierrez continues to refuse to accept responsibility for her role in the death of Helena Hutchins. Um, rather than accept responsibility, she has chosen to place blame on the witnesses who testified against her. Me, you, the jurors, the set medic, and the paramedics who tried to save Ms. Hutchins' life. Her jail calls, and there were probably close to 200 of them, tell us who Ms. Gutierrez really is. And in the, in the state's opinion, uh, the content and tone of her calls demonstrates that Ms. Gutierrez should not receive any type of a reduced sentence. Helena Hutchins died due to a cascade of safety violations that began with Ms. Gutierrez introducing live rounds to the movie set, loading one into a prop gun, telling the members of the crew that it was a cold gun, thereby ensuring that it would make its way into the hands of Mr. Baldwin. That conduct, absent responsibility or remorse, is deserving of a sentence of 18 months in the Department of Corrections with a designation as a serious violent offender. And that is what the state will be requesting today. Um, and those are the only arguments I intend to make in terms of sentencing. I would like to move into the presentation uh, of the witnesses who would like to address the court on behalf of Ms. Hutchins and her family. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with Craig Mizrahi. Mr. Mizrahi. Your Honor. My name is Craig Mizrahi and I was Helena's agent. I was compelled to be present today. Okay, to your mic on. Can you yes. talk a little into the, more, the mic? More into the mic. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I was compelled to be present today to express the impact of the loss of Helena, who was a cherished friend, wife, mother, and artist, senselessly lost on October 21st, 2021. I was first introduced to Helena when a mutual friend sent me samples of her cinematography. I was pleasantly surprised to see how mature and refined it was, especially given the small budgets she was working with. I imagined what she could do if given the time and resources of a large film, and I instantly knew I wanted to work with her. What stood out for me was her passion, her intense preparation, her resourcefulness and creativity on set, and the kindness and generosity she showed to all those she worked with. In getting to know her husband, Matt, 
It was clear that he and their son Andros supported every career move she made and accepted the very difficult reality that she would have to travel for work very often. This rare combination of talent, work ethic, collaboration, and family support was what truly set her apart. In 2021, Helena's star continued to rise. Her name was mentioned around Hollywood as someone to watch, and just two weeks before she began on Rust, Helena got her first meeting on a big studio film. She came in a close second for that job, and instead of focusing on why it didn't go her way, she felt great confidence that she was finally playing with the big boys. When Rust came her way, she felt excited for the visual challenge that a Western would bring. She enjoyed meeting the director, Joel, and believed in his vision for the film, so we went for it. Two days before she died, Helena called me. It was very late, but she wanted to say she just had dinner with Joel and Alec, and she was so happy to be working with them. She felt the film would be a great next step and was excited for what was to come in 2022. I agreed and said, sleep well, tomorrow's another big day. That was the last time I spoke to Helena. October 21st was a fateful day that would change the lives of so many. Most of all, Andros, who at nine years old, would have to somehow comprehend the terrifying reality of losing his mother in this way. In the time that's passed, while the pain persists, the circumstances surrounding the disaster force upon us so many questions, with one in particular above all, how could this have happened? It's my opinion that, generally speaking, film producers are responsible to ensure the cast and crew members hired are experienced enough to handle their jobs. And when it comes to hiring the armorer on a Western, I believe safety is the only job. So when the producers hired someone with virtually no experience to not only be the armorer, but also the assistant prop master, two very challenging positions in their own right, they made a crucial decision to put sa the safety of their cast and crew on the back burner. As for Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, it's my opinion that she should not have held either position, much less both, but that once accepted, the responsibility should have been taken more seriously. Sadly, it wasn't, and we all know the result. Since that terrible day, I've spoken with hundreds of producers, film executives, and directors about how we can come together as an industry to make sets safer from gun violence. But the truth is that if Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and the producers of Rust simply followed the decades-old written guidelines for the film industry, specifically the use of firearms and ammunition, this tragedy would never have happened. In that sense, I hope we can all agree that this was not a simple accident. It was a chain of events that led to the killing of someone, and that chain would have been broken if the armor was doing the job she was hired to do. I often think about what Helena's future would have been, and it makes me smile. I can assure you it would have been bright, filled with spending time with Andros and watching him grow up. She would have been able to help her support her family in Ukraine, especially when they needed her most through the horror of war. She would have traveled the world shooting beautiful images and eventually becoming the director that would change hearts and minds with her poignant and purposeful storytelling. In the end, she'd likely finish her career as she started at the American Film Institute, giving back to the next generation of, of filmmakers. Sadly, we'll never know because Helena's life was taken away from us much too soon. So today we stand determined to seek justice for Helena, to hold accountable those responsible for her death, and to ensure that such a tragedy never occurs again. I want to thank Ms. Morrissey and her team for having me here today, and thank you, Your Honor, for your service in the case. Thank you. Emilia Mendieta. Your Honor, my name is Amelia Mendieta. I was one of Helena's best friends and one of her colleagues in a classmate of hers at the American Film Institute Conservatory. Helena and I met on August 2013 in the registration line on our first day at the American Film Institute Conservatory. I was quietly suffering through a small bout of imposter syndrome and desperately trying to hide my nerves about officially starting the cinematography program. I don't think I was hiding them very well because this joyful, energetic woman bounced right over to me and invited me out to lunch. We then piled into her RAV4, already chock full of film gels and diffusion that almost hid the baby seat in the back from view, and off we went. After a quick burrito and some pastries, we headed back to campus for our first orientation sessions. We were friends ever since. But that was Lena, a joyful soul who could just as easily strike up a friendship as she could capture a beautiful image. 
Even while at AFI, Helena stood out as an exceptional artist and cinematographer. She was creative and ambitious and quickly became well known for her skills and insistent pursuit of excellence. The first time I got to work with her on her, was on her second film on her first year. I was on her camera team. Her love and passion for lighting was evident, and you could tell that she was masterful in her approach even then. I'm pretty sure she used every single light on the grip and lighting truck, but she used them, used them well. It's also the film where I broke a blue streak filter that she had borrowed from one of her classmates as I was rushing to get it to her. As I showed her the blue sh the filter shards, apologizing profusely because I felt I had ruined her project, I could see she was disappointed. Not at me, but at the fact that she would have to rethink her ridiculously planned creative approach. A feat she accomplished as she went along with the rest of the day. As I was profusely apologizing a rap yet again, she pulled me into a big hug and said, Emmy, it's just a filter. They break. Friendships don't break over a filter. Despite the great fil filter incident of first year, we went on to collaborate on most projects at AFI and beyond. At first, we crewed for each other on our first year films, our visual essays, and our first feature films. After that, as our careers grew, we leaned on each other for emotional and technical support. She even stepped in in front of the camera for a music video I shot and directed, despite her aversion to being on that end of the lens, like most cinematographers. But only for you, Emmy, and only this once, she quipped. As she stared down my gaffer, sweating on the sidelines with a stare that read, I know where that light should go, and you better not put it where it should be. I loved being on her sets or just talking with her about what she was going to do because she was always trying something new, something innovative. She was luminous and endlessly curious. Helena would research how she wanted to accomplish something and make it happen. She had this uncanny ability to balance her career ambitions, her family life, and still lead a thriving social life. I admired and still admire that. I have no idea how she did it. I've always held her in high esteem as a classmate and colleague, but to me, she was first and foremost one of my closest friends in grad school and beyond. We were able to confide and trust in each other as we navigated the challenges of being women in cinematography. That extended to confiding in each other about navigating our personal and professional lives in the film industry at large. One of the beautiful things about our friendship is that we could just as easily wax poetic about the goat cheese salad at the cute brunch spot we had trekked out to over in Venice Beach, or the chromatic aberrations of the lenses we had used on one of our last projects that you really, you know, had given the story some character. But really what I remember her most for was her adventures and generous spirit. As our lives and careers grew and we got busier, we'd try to meet up for a meal every month or so. It was often lunch, followed by a brisk walk, and usually ending with a coffee and pastry. She had a big sweet tooth. Whenever we would sit down to eat, she'd always look at the dessert menu first. She favored pastries with chocolate, but she liked cookies too. I make decorated sugar cookies for my friends on Christmas, dropping them off the second week of December. Every year without fail, not even an hour after I would drop off hers at her house, she'd text me pictures of the empty cookie bag, followed by some of her and her son happily eating them in one, all in one sitting. Sometimes her son would come along with us on our outings, bouncing with energy. Her spirit mirrored in him. Her little man, she would call him. Her husband and her son were her boys, and she often spoke of them lovingly. Helena was proud of being a mom, and often spoke about how the experience changed her life, sometimes even egging me on to have kids whenever I did find a partner. And motherhood was important to her, but I think people were important to her, and she prioritized them a lesson I've taken to heart since her passing, and a balance that most of us in the industry struggle to achieve on a daily basis sometimes. Helena was also a social butterfly, the quintessential extrovert that had a knack for somehow going to every single event she was invited to, and being bright and bubbly and charismatic. Most of her friends were introverts though, myself included. We'd like to joke that she had collected a small gaggle of us along the way and made sure we showed up to these events too. She would call you up whenever to talk to you about going to some event and um, one that my own little introverted heart maybe would have not dared gone otherwise. <laughs> and she would make sure you weren't left alone. She made a point to take care of us and include us. I appreciate that. It was, still is, so hard to come out of my shell and she made things easier socially. Now whenever I go to an event and I'm doubting whether I should go, I ask myself, what would Helena do? The answer is usually go. 
Late in the summer of 2021, I got a call from her. I was prepping for my third feature film that I was starting filming in a week away, and I hadn't heard from her much since I knew she had been a different project in Canada for most of the summer. I'm at LAX, she said happily. Do you have any suggestions of where I can have good food in Santa Fe? She knew I had family in New Mexico at the time and had spoken lovingly about New Mexican cuisine before. What are you doing in New Mexico? I asked, pouring out a small list of recommendations. I'm shooting a Western. She sounded really excited. It had been a dream for both of us to shoot genre films. It's so hard to land a genre job sometimes, and she has a soft spot for both Westerns and hard sci-fi. I was really excited for her, too, and we reveled at her, reveled at her good fortune on the phone. It has horses and gunfights, and we're shooting out in the desert. It's a huge stepping stone for me. It's going to be so much fun, she said excitedly. And she felt it, that it could be the project that could actually help her career propel forward. <laughs> Little did we know that it would be the project that killed her. I often think about that moment, her excitement, her joy at embarking at this new adventure. I think about how hard she worked to get there, to get that opportunity. It kills me a little inside. The last time we spoke was the day before Russ started shooting. I called her before because a friend of mine gifted me four tickets to Disneyland that would expire by the end of the year. And I thought it would be a really nice gesture to invite Helena and her boys to the park for the day. She seemed excited about going to the park. She hadn't been in a while and felt it could be a good break after the shoot. She mentioned pre-production had been a bit hectic and stressful, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary in the independent film world. I've since begun to question what is and isn't normal, and what should be happening and shouldn't. But I was fresh off my own low-budget feature experience and had a bit of the blues regarding some of my own challenges with that shoot. I confided my doubts in my career with her, my insecurities at the moment. Just another bout of imposter syndrome. She got called to a last-minute meeting. She had to go. Emmy. You're so young and so talented. I have no doubt that you'll make it in this industry. I believe in you. I believe you're an amazing cinematographer in person. Please remember that. Gotta go. We'll talk soon. Love you. Those were the last four words she ever said to me. I believe in you. Those four words will forever echo in my soul. They're a bright light in the darkness of this whole situation. They keep me going when times get tough. And times have been tough. I was working at a news station in Sacramento, California on October 21st, 2021, but I heard the news through the grapevine. One of my mentors called me to tell me something had happened on a set in New Mexico. They wanted to know if I'd spoken to Helena. I would not. I was able to get in contact with her husband, who confirmed the worst. I confirmed the news to another one of our mentors. I heard his heart break over the phone, too. I sat alone in the darkness of my apartment for hours, sobbing uncontrollably. My wonderful, generous, adventurous friend was gone. Killed on a set because a live bullet that wasn't a prop gun. It dawned on me. Someone didn't do their job right. A lot of someones didn't do their job right. I'm also a director of photography. I trained at the same school, graduated the same year, got the same degree. We belong to the same organizations, went to the same networking, networking events, pursue the art of visual storytelling with the same passion. I've been on sets with guns. I've been on sets where blanks were fired at my camera. I know what an armorer's job is. I know the safety procedures that must be followed. And as more and more details of the case came out, it boggled my mind how many of these procedures had been either blatantly disregarded or not followed at all. Helena's death is the result of a massive system failure where many links of the chain were loose or faulty, and they all failed her, all of them. But it all boils down to a very simple question. Why was there a live bullet on set? A live bullet should never have made this way onto the set, let alone the gun, full stop. And that is where Hannah Gutierrez read as the armor on rust fail Helena. It was her job to check the guns, check the bullets, and make sure that the set was safe. Even two and a half years later, her absence still catches me by surprise. Every time I go to a networking event, I still glance at the door, expecting Helena to walk in, her platinum blonde pixie cut perfectly coiffed, leather cuffs on her wrists, naturally cool with her signature adventures glint in her eye. At her funeral, I saw the house she never spent a single night in, the one she had bought just before coming to New Mexico. I almost called her after watching Dune Part 2 to see what she thought of it and remembered that she died before she was even able to watch Part 1. 
I wanted to tell her about the amazing experience I had on set a month and a half ago, about how much I had gelled with the director and the producer and was proud of the work I'd done. I haven't been able to make, bring myself to make Christmas cookies in the past two years. The thought of not seeing her weighing heavily on me. What's left of the film gels that were in the back of the car that first day we met are now in my living room. The last vestiges of her that I was able to salvage. Her 45th birthday was last week. I went to her grave instead of having dinner and celebrating with her. And while I feel her absence personally, the industry at large feels her loss deeply. I lost one of my best friends, but the industry lost a true visionary. We were robbed of all the images she had the ability to create, all the films she didn't shoot. Her son will grow up without his mother, her family continuing on without her. I know we can never get her back, but what I want is change and justice. I want those that had a hand in her death, either through action or inaction, to face the consequence, consequences of those decisions. This includes Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. I ask the court to give her a sentence commensurate and fair to her actions in the role of the death of my dear friend Helena Hutchins. Holding Ms. Gutierrez-Reed accountable will reverberate beyond just the sentencing. It reminds everyone in this industry that actions taken to compromise the safety of our workplace, even if unintentionally, have serious consequences. There are people that leave an indelible mark on your soul, an imprint that can never be erased. And the memory of her wit, her kindness, and her unwavering belief in me are permanently etched into mine. She, she always had my back. And I promised her that I would always continue to have hers. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to switch to uh, the Google Meet speakers. <clears throat> if I can approach, because I can't see from my computer exactly how long. Just hold on. Yeah, if you just have them to Okay. Okay, hear you. Okay, great. Let's uh, let's begin with uh, Anak Rabini. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Anak Rabinal, and I thank the court for this opportunity to speak about the impact of Polina's killing on me. I know I'm supposed to address the court today, but in writing this, it felt more appropriate to address my friend, colleague, creative partner, and playmate, since we never had the chance to say goodbye. Oh, woman, where do I even start? I'm having a flashback to helping you write your AFI application. At least then, you were there to talk it out and have a little bicker, as was our typical dynamic. Instead, it's just me alone, staring at a blank page, listening to silence. Why don't we start with the hard stuff first, the stuff that's been pinging around in my head for the last couple of years? They say that death comes in threes. Within the space of a month in the fall of 2021, you were the third death of someone who had been fundamental in shaping my adult understanding of myself in the world. As if you need me to come at you with more Hamlet in the afterlife. But it truly was when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. As I processed the reality of the news that had reached me, there were three thoughts that kept coming up. What a terrible, painful, scary way to die. Over and over again, I kept seeing you in my mind's eyes suffering needlessly, feeling you fight a battle that you were going to lose. But then I kept thinking, what's going to happen to Andros? And then selfishly, how will we ever resolve our reconciliation? That August, when you remembered my birthday out of the blue, it was like maybe it's time to heal the two and a half year rift that had silenced a bond that had, for the majority of its decade long duration, consisted of communicating almost daily. But then that wasn't possible anymore. You were gone. There were so many wonderful things that would never happen again. Indulging you in story time before bed during a shoot so that you could fall asleep on the phone 
while I drone on so you could dream of our brain baby. Who knew that was a weirdly us state? Because you should see the faces of other DPs when I ask them if they need a nighttime tuck-in. There will be no more hanging out in your kitchen, trying not to eat too many squirrels before going on some kind of adventure. Because who knew what the bathroom situation would be whilst random words, whilst you teach me random words in Russian, and I'd watch you make cracked out Turkish coffee with all orange peel as pregame fuel. The two of us always plotting how we would get something epic done with very little money, sorting out our next tag team, Thelma and Louise racket. Never again would I be your habitual plus one to some crazy inspirational thing where we'd be in full on Lucy and Ethel mode, dead set on meeting the celebrity VIP who was in attendance. And usually we did, because really, who could resist our wonder twin charms? There will be no more fraught existential conversations about what we were doing with our lives and careers or any more big dreams, ideas cooked up together to be kicked down the road for when we'd have the resources and enough clout to do them. You and me, none of our ideas ever liked the small budget. Thank goodness we managed three times with what we had to push out some of our kids into the world. Almost every day, my Facebook memories feed reminds me of some kind of trouble we were up to and some dream we were manifesting into reality. Daily, it reminds me of the two people who are gone, you and the person you inspired and expected me to be, as crazy making as you could be, because let's not gild the lily. Anyone who ever truly got to know you knew how stubborn, determined, and no holds barred you could get when you set your mind to something, and how diplomacy wasn't your way. Yet as crazy making as that could be, you would bring out the best of me. Even if that involved breaking some eggs, so to speak, and you'd bring out the best in every person you engaged with. Recent events have made me come to appreciate how with you, I didn't need a filter or to tone it down or to say it in a nice way. And the gift of being with someone who can accept the light and the dark in you is a rare, rare thing in this world. Even more rare is someone who is courageous enough to show up as authentically as you did. And here's the part that's easy, talking about what I admired in you, your courage and tenacity. I mean, you could spin your wheels in a neurotic frenzy, but when push came to show, you would dig in, face your fears and grab hold of your courage and go. The fact that you moved to a foreign country on your own as a young adult to pursue a dream is testament enough to your indomitable spirit, and it didn't stop there. You lived every single moment you had, and you never met a challenge you didn't give your best shot to. I admired your love of beauty and how you sought it out everywhere you looked. Maybe it came from having terrible eyesight when you were a kid but you looked at the world with wonder and intensity. Your search for different ways of touching and feeling with your eyes and your inability to settle if something wasn't the way it should be was one of the commonalities that held us together and truth be told, the bedrock of trust that got us through the rockier patches because neither of us would let each other be less than our best. I admired your innocence of being you approached everything with the ingenuity and insouciance of a child, and that takes guts in a world that continually tries to turn us into jaded, beaten down cynics. This is the short list of things that I loved and still love about you. With you gone, I find myself worrying about Andros, praying that he will have had enough of you and your vision to treasure the gift that was being born into this life with you as his mother. I still remember the day I visited you, him, and Matt after he was born thinking, shit, he's one brave bitch doing this motherhood thing. While your death is what one might call meaningless, as in it was wholly unnecessary and preventable, I pray that it will echo through time to ensure that its circumstances will not be repeated anywhere else and with anyone else. I pray that it will serve as a rallying point for the systemic change needed in an industry 
but sees the human beings who put their lives in service of it as dispensable cogs in a machine to serve bottom lines and shareholder expectations. You always fought the good fight, and your death will count for something more than this sadness and regret that it's left in its wake. Every one of us whose lives you touched owe you that. When I started writing this, I went to look back for that very first picture of the two of us together so that I could have something with you, something of you with me today. December 25th, 2011. It's funny to think in hindsight that we were the universe's Christmas present to each other. Our friends who introduced us were happy that we were both getting our starts in film and hoped it would be a good connection. Who knew that that Christmas would lead here? If only it had, it had led to what we both dreamt together. Being fabulous older ladies at some glamorous parties after being awarded some big accolades and driving everyone around us crazy because we'd still be bickering and nitpicking on how we could have made the film better. I miss you, my friend. I'm sorry we won't be able to say the things that needed to be said, the apologies that needed to be exchanged. It's painful to know that we won't grow old together. All I know, all I can do now is promise you that I'll do my best to live up to being the person and artist you knew and wanted me to be and to do my utmost to uphold your legacy. And now I thank the court for permitting me this time to this year to impact of Polina's death on me and to ask it to do what it should to bring justice to this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Olia Oparina. Thank you, Your Honor. Paulina and I immigrated to the U.S. around the same time, bonding over our shared passion for film. From the moment we've met, she became more than a friend. She was my sister in every sense of the word. Paulina was always there celebrating our victories and offering unwavering support during our toughest moments as immigrants and young filmmakers. As a mother, a talented cinematographer, and a successful woman, Helena juggled numerous responsibilities, yet she always made time for her friends. Our daily hikes were not just about exercise, they were moments of solace and connection, where Helena's words of encouragement lifted my spirits without fail. Together as female filmmakers, we confronted the obstacles of our industry, finding strengths in each other's company, Helena poured her heart into every project, infusing it, infusing it with generosity and kindness that left a lasting impact on everyone she worked with. Her presence on set was a beacon of light, spreading joy wherever she went. She often overlooked her own needs, prioritizing others above herself. When Helena passed away, I was consumed by grief, feeling the loss of not only my closest friend, but also my greatest source of inspiration. She represented hope for a brighter future in the film industry, where creativity and kindness could strive. Losing her meant losing a part of myself and a cherished creative collaborator. Though she may no longer be with us, Helena's legacy lives on in the hearts of all who knew her. We are committed to honoring her memory by continuing to champion the values she held dear, ensuring that her impact on the world will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Metz. Okay. Okay, uh, Jen White. feels impossible to put into words the devastation that I've felt and will forever feel from the loss of my friend Helena Hutchins. 
because mere words could never hold all of who she was or what she meant to me. It is absolutely indescribable, but I will try anyway. Two and a half years have passed and I still look for her. I still expect to see her. I still wonder what adventure she's on and think about checking in. Then my heart drops through my feet and I have to face the reality that I will never see her or hug her or hear her laugh ever again. I will never get to feel that glow that she bathed everyone around her in. And I will never get to be there to celebrate what would have undoubtedly been many, many children. Helena was a force. She was complicated and talented and beautiful and caring and kind and funny and committed and charming and weird and fearless. She was all of my favorite adjectives. She inspired me. And I don't think she knew that because I never got to tell her. She was one of my favorite people in the world. I feel like she has gotten lost in the swarm of all of the finger pointing and blame in the aftermath of this completely preventable tragedy. The only way I have left to honor her is to do everything I can to make sure this never happens again and to try to make sure that the people responsible are held accountable. I've struggled to deal with this repeatedly being called an accident because it was not an accident. It was negligence and nothing else. Every single day there is gunplay on film sets carried out safely by qualified armorers. There are countless checks and balances to ensure safety for the cast and crew, and it seems every single one of them was ignored on this production. There were multiple failures by multiple people, that is certain, and the actions of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed were the catalyst for Helena's death. By bringing live ammunition to set, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed set off a chain of events that could only lead to someone being killed, which was ensured by her not properly checking the rounds, by her, not leaving, by her leaving guns and ammunition unattended, by allowing the assistant director to take the gun from her, and by allowing her, by allowing Helena to be in the path of that bullet in the first place. Multiple breaches and protocol committed by the defendant made this inevitable, and it was only a matter of time. There's one absolute truth here. If Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had properly done her job, Helena would still be alive, and Andros would still have his mother. Your Honor, I beg you to impose the maximum sentence. It will not be and could never be enough of a punishment for the willful negligence committed by the defendant. But she needs to be held accountable for taking Helena's life and for destroying so many others. It doesn't seem to me or anyone that I've spoken to that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed has ever demonstrated even the slightest bit of remorse for her actions and instead chooses to throw blame at everyone but herself. If prison time is the only way she will face any responsibility for what she has done, it should be for as long as the law allows. Because the ripples of her negligence will never stop being felt by those of us who knew and loved her. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Souza. The other person was on that Metz, Stephen Metz. Oh, okay. Uh, then let's go ahead and do uh, Mr. Metz instead of Mr. Souza. We'll do. We'll, we'll hear from Mr. Souza last. Hello. I'm Stephen Metz, and uh, I just want to. I did prepare a statement, so I'm just going to read the statement off, and then maybe have a little bit. Uh, the death of Helena Hutchins has had a profound impact on me and my family. I was a very close friend of Helena and her family for many years. Our sons have been best friends since they were four years old. And Helena's husband, Matt, was one of my best friends. Helena and I would like <clears throat> would talk a lot about extreme sports. We spent time biking, riding, rock climbing with our kids. Uh, when she was not out of town working, which was quite a bit. Matt and I would hang out um, and let our kids play. They played together all the time. Uh, during the pandemic, it was really nice because Selena was not working for a good part of it, and we were able to spend a lot of time together 
uh, if you remember during the pandemic, there were kind of these um, certain families that you could, uh, we, we called them a pod. So you could, um, you know, just, we kind of hung out with like just a very select and a uh, few families and the Hudson's family is one of them. Um, <clears throat> so we would hang out in person. We wouldn't, you know, we didn't wear masks because they were considered, you know, our really close friends. Um, so uh, in, as far as the impact that, that I have seen so far, Matt was devastated when he lost the love of his life. Uh, I know how much he loved Felina. They were married for over 16 years and they were a wonderful couple. Uh, the loss is devastating to everyone who knew them. Uh, because it turns out, after everything is said and done, we've not only lost Felina, but we've also lost Matt. And we, we uh, basically, Matt has been affected uh, tra horribly by this, and he moved away. So um, basically, Matt died uh, when when Helena died, as far as we're concerned. Meaning he moved away. He was somebody that I hung out with more than uh, once or twice a week on average. And uh, so in, in Helena's passing and in the negligence that I believe occurred on that set, uh, he didn't only kill or affect Helena, which I know it goes without saying, but it still should be said. You affected many other families and people uh, around uh, Helena. So um, anyway, the loss of Helena has had a ripple effect on our whole community. He was a talented cinematographer, and she was loved by everyone who knew her. Her death is a reminder of the fragility of life, and it, it has left us shaken and sad. Uh, that's an understatement. There's really no, uh, there's no excuse. I mean, you, you have a professional on the set. Now, I don't know all the protocol for, for film. That's not my field, but I do know that you have to take uh, gun safety extremely. You have to be handled uh, with extreme caution in every way. And uh, I really feel that this was due to negligence. So uh, being that there are thousands and thousands of films being made all over the world, uh, this needs to set a precedent. This, this case needs to set a precedent for all of the other, uh, you know, for all the other actors whose lives and, and cinematographers and everyone on the set really, whose lives are at risk with uh, when we have negligence in the in the hands of an armor or supposed armor so um anyway it was a horrible uh, experience for uh, not just the hutchins family but also for our family my son basically lost his really good friend i i, I honestly don't even know if they uh, really talk very much anymore i they start almost every day and play video games together and uh, and it was a tragedy so um, very very sad and that's my that's the end of my statement Thank you. Joel Souza. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I would like to thank the court as well as Ms. Morrissey and her team for allowing me to speak today. I struggled with what to say here today because what I want is simply not possible. I want that none of this ever happened, that everyone's okay, and that lives weren't destroyed, and that, worst of all, and his life wasn't lost. Um, I would not presume to speak for Helena, nor for her husband or her son, for her parents or her sister, but I would like to say something on their behalf, if I might. Uh, Helena's parents lost their daughter. Her sister lost a sibling and confidant. Matt lost his wife, the other half of himself. <laughs> And Helena's son lost not only his mother, but everything she had to offer him for the rest of her life. Every kind word, every loving gesture, every support, every influence, every life's lesson, the course of his life has been irrevocably altered. And the world lost not only a person that was a gifted artist, but a truly kind and compassionate person, which often seemed to be in short supply these days. As for myself, the last two and a half years are difficult to put into words. Um, what it's done to me and the burdens it's placed on me, both emotionally and physically, are my private burdens, and I think I'll choose to keep them that way today. What I will say is that one moment the world made sense, and the next moment it didn't, and it still doesn't, and I don't know if it ever will again. Um, so again, what I really want, I can't have. 
I want everyone damaged by Miss Reed's failures that day to find peace. I want this whole thing not to have been consumed by the world as some sick form of mass entertainment, but I want to still believe in the better angels of our nature. I want the pain to go away. I want to be who I was before this happened, and above all, I want Helena to be back home with her husband and son in the house she never got to live in. Uh, Helena not only had an incredible talent for her art, but she had a talent for life. She was a touchstone for all who knew her, and those of us who were lucky enough to have shared in her fleeting time on this planet are better for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a, a brief written statement by one of Helena's uh, friends, Anya Bay, and that will be read by Alexander James. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anya Bay. I'm the filmmaker and a very close friend of Helena Hutchins. I want to apologize for not being able to attend in person because of my last minute trip overseas, but I'm very grateful for the state for reading my statement. I've known Helena since 2014 when I first moved to LA. It was impossible not to connect and fall in love with her instantly as she was that bright beam of light, creativity, and energy that could easily ignite the room, if not the entire city. Her passion for cinema was infectious. Her ability to enjoy life and love people around was evident. I felt very privileged to have her by my side, encouraging all of my endeavors. As my family lives far away, Helena became one of a few people that, firm, that formed my family circle in Los Angeles. We traveled and celebrated holidays together. We supported each other through thick and thin, and of course, we created beautiful films together. We were working side by side, Helena as a director of photography, and I was a writer slash producer. We collaborated on multiple amazing projects, including our very first feature film, which was almost impossible to make. But not for Helena, she didn't believe in impossible. She was a fearless leader with a unique creative vision and deep appreciation for her crew. And I know that hundreds of people can back me up on that. She was a true inspiration. We had many more plans to realize and dreams to fulfill together, and it still doesn't sit with me that it's never going to happen. Helena was a very loving mother and wife, daughter and sister, friend and cinematographer. She was a cinematographer with the capital C, perhaps the most dedicated filmmaker I know, who would always go an extra mile, if not a hundred miles, only to take the best shot regardless of how hard it was. Just when finally, after all these years of hard work, she started to get recognized in Hollywood, which we all know could be very cruel and heartbreaking. This horrible turn of events during the production of Rust should have never happened. Set safety should never be overlooked, or as in this case, completely and utterly disregarded, especially when it comes to weapons. I want to end with this. The tragic death of the incredible Helena Hutchins is not just a huge loss for her family, friends, and people that knew and loved her so much. It's a loss for the entire film community. She deserved better. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Gloria Allred will address the court on behalf of Helena's mother, father, and sister.
Attorney Glory, all red, all red, Morocco and Goldberg. Uh, and also uh, on behalf of my co-counsel, John Carpenter, Carpenter and Zuckerman, um, I would like to read a statement by Helena's mother, and then we have a video of her mother, whose name is Olga Solovey, and she will be speaking in uh, Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles uh, for uh, Olga's statement. After that, I would like to read a very brief statement by uh, the sister of Helena, Svetlana Zemko, who will also speak in Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles for her video. And finally, I do, I would uh, appreciate the indulgence of the court to read a short statement of uh, Helena's father. We have no video for him due to his health. Uh, his name is Anatoly Androsevich. Uh, and then I will conclude, I have some photos as well of uh, the parents and sister with Helena. So thank you very much for your courtesy in this matter. Uh, this is a statement of Olga Solovey, Helena Hutchins' mother. Good afternoon. My name is Olga, and I am the mother of Helena. It is extremely difficult for me to speak about this. Helena was the best daughter on this earth. I remember how she graduated with the most excellent marks from two universities here in Ukraine. Even so, she left for the USA to study and pursue her dreams. She had a beautiful family, her son Andros. She loved him madly and endlessly. All of her friends absolutely adored her. After this tragedy, my life has been split into two before and after. Time does not heal. It simply prolongs my pain and suffering. I have hope that the guilty, those that are responsible for the death of my daughter, will be punished fairly and sentenced justly. Justice must prevail. And I would like to say also that Olga and Svetlana made these videos despite the fact that where they live in Ukraine, in Kyiv, they are being bombed every single day. This is the video of Olga. Хаченко, мене звуть Ольга. Сьогодні я хотіла б вам розказати про свою доньку, яка була дуже талановита, гарна, дуже гарно вчилась, дуже добре, добре до нас ставилась. Я пам'ятаю той день, коли її не стало. Мені дуже тяжко. Дуже тяжко без неї. Я не можу. в університеті, потім вона родила гарного хлопчика, мого внука, з яким я зараз не маю можливості бачити. Вона була дуже гарною матір'ю, але більше всього вона працювати любила. Все моє життя дуже-дуже тяжко дивитися, як дитина росте без матері.
Я хотіла б ще сказати, що вона вчилася в школі дуже гарно, на відмінно. Тому що закінчила всі вузи, в яких вона навчалася. Я від усіх, від усіх чула тільки гарні слова. І сьогодні мені не проходиться біль втрати. Сила до них кожен рік. Я бачила, як Андрос підростає. Як він на неї дуже схожий. Оля дуже нас всіх любила. Вона завжди говорила, мама, я хочу, щоб ви жили краще. Весь час вона мене прилишала до себе. Вона хотіла, щоб я була поруч. А от оскільки ще Світлана була не зовсім дорослою, я не могла поїхати. Я їй обіцяла, що коли Света буде замужем, коли в неї буде чоловік, я приїду обов'язково. Але я не встигла. У Галі дуже було багато друзів, які завжди приходили до нас, з якими вона старалась підтримувати контакти. Вона всім дзвонила. Ми з нею зазванювались кожну неділю. У нас був день, це субота або неділя, ми завжди спілкувалися годинами. Кращого друга, ніж Галя, в мене не було. Ми могла поділитися зі мною усім. У неї дуже гарна сім'я була. Але цей день перевернув все життя. Мені дуже важко без неї. Я весь час чекаю, коли я з нею зустрінуся. Але я дала собі слово, що я обов'язково побачу, що виросте, коли він буде навчатися, коли він жениться. Коли в нього буде своя сім'я, і я повинна триматися. Ой, я не можу. Коли Галя загинула, було три години ночі у нас. Я не могла заснути, я до трьох ночі не спала, мені було дуже тривожно. А в три часа я побачила, що Дзвонить мед. Я дуже перелякалася. Значить, щось случилось. Бо вночі він ніколи мені не дзвонив. І він не міг довго сказати, що сталося. Він тільки сказав, мама, у нас біда. І хвилин п'ять він не міг сказати. Я кажу, так говорив вже, що сталося. Каже, Галі немає. Після того я не пам'ятаю нічого. Я була одна вдома. Я кричала. Я йому ще говорю, може, може ще не ясно, може ще все буде добре. Але він мені сказав, що її немає. Дуже важко втрачати дітей. За словами не передати. І час не допомагає. Пройшло два з половиною роки. А місто є ще гірше. 
як що перший рік я ще думала, ждала, що вона приїде. А цей рік я себе настраювала, пробувала змиритися з тим, що сталося. Але, наверное, я слабка. Хотя Аля казала, что ты мама сильная. Ну, у меня не получается. Я хочу сказать, что мне легче не станет от того, что хоть засудят. На сколько лет, это не имеет значения. Але я хочу, чтобы была справедливость, чтобы кто-то виноват, хай понесе накарання, покарання за свой злочин. Мне очень хотелось, чтобы до меня кто-то подошел, мне поспівчував, вибачився, подивився просто в очи, мне хотелось подивитися. Тим людям, може, мені було б легше. Але ніхто не підійшов. Я була на похоронах, я їздила в минулому році, в жовтні місяці, але я про мегаліних друзів нікого не бачила. И боляче. Люди, которые виноваты, они даже не подошли до матери. Я не могу сделать. Все люди, которые причепні до смерти Гали, никто до меня не подходил, никто не вибачався, никто не співчував. Она очень много работала. На его счет был расписан, но больше всего в жизни она любила своего сына. Я не знаю, у них настолько были отношения, понимаете? Она просто не могла надихаться им. Она звонила ему каждый день, она рассказывала ему сказки, она все ему рассказывала про работу, говорила на добраніч, и он отдыхал. Это было каждый день. Не было такого дня, чтобы она не звонила ему, когда была в отряджении. Всегда посмехалась, была весела, счастлива такая. И очень рада тешилась в том, что у нее все получается, что у нее все складывается так, как она хотела. Я думаю, что она была счастлива. В семейных отношениях у них все было добре. Она еще очень хотела девочку. Первый месяц я была там целый месяц. Когда мы приехали, я попросила, чтобы они могли кремировать ее не в Мехико, но я попросила, я хотела попрощаться. Привезла в Лос-Анджелес. Мы попрощались, а прах мы забирали через две недели. И тогда похоронили ее на кладбище Голливуд навсегда называется в центре города, міста. Дуже в красивом месте, там, где проходят фильмы все новые, ритмы. Там велика сцена, там собирается дуже багато людей, и там показывают новые фильмы, которые выходят. И она рядом с сценой похована. Канал красивый, там лебеди плавают.
I'd just like to add, Your Honor, that Olga is one of the most courageous women I have ever met, in addition to living in the war zone and suffering the tragedy of her daughter. She is a nurse who cares for those who have been wounded in the war. Next is uh, Svetlana Zemko, Helena's sister. And, Helena, and Svetlana says this, as I gathered my thoughts to write this statement, I wanted to start by emphasizing an important memory. When my mother and I were building our homes in Kyiv, one of the most fundamental things we were dreaming of was how our entire family would gather together comfortably at this home with Helena. As it stands now, that will never happen again. I very much wanted for Helena to meet my children and my husband. Helena will never meet my baby boy who was born after her death. Her death has shattered my heart. She was not simply my sister. She was my friend and in a certain sense, my second mother. The video of Svetlana. Я молодша сестра, вона старша на 7 років. То вона мені була в якомусь сенсі матусею навіть, бо приймала участь у моєму вихованні. У нас було дуже багато і таких теплих, смішних історій. І коли я була зовсім маленька, то у нас був такий не знаю, як це сказати, змагання, хто кого передражнить. Але згодом, коли ми стали дорослішими, то ми, у нас ці стосунки із виховання з її боку перетекли більш такі дружні. І ці межі вікові, вони стерлися. І ми почали там тусуватися разом, десь їздити на шопінг, знайомитися, проводити час по-інакшому. Як... Я тоді так кайфувала, думала, вау, я така доросла. Вона мене брала десь із собою, ми цікаво проводили час. Навіть просто поїхати на прогулянку, вона мені давала свій одяг, у неї був завжди дуже модний одяг, вона мала гарний смак. І... Для мене було це так тепло, що вона зі мною ділилася. І, може, ця, цю якість мені таку не жмота, можна так виразитися. Це, може, і від неї трохи пішло, бо вона така ніколи не прижимала навіть шоколад, коли у нас був. Вона ділила все порівну. Ніколи, вона не брала собі ніколи більше. Це як по-братськи, -по по-братимськи, чи як кажуть. Я всім ходила, потякала, кажу, моя сестра у мене найкрутіша. Я ще жартувала, кажу, що у нас е, е, я такий ледащо, а сестра працює за двох із нас. Вона дуже багато працювала, щоб дістатися своєї мети. Дуже багато. Моя сестра була крута. Це був мій друг, це було моє натхнення у якомусь сенсі, бо коли мені ставало якось зле, я завжди думала, ось у тебе сестра така крута. І завжди було пофіг на усі проблеми, вона йшла вперед завжди. Тобто ця цілеспрямовленість, вона завжди так надихала. І мені здається, не тільки мене, бо вона така взагалі була світла людина, і я навіть не можу сказати ніякого, е, ніяку, жодної поганої або мінусової характеристики дати їй, е, ну, ніяк, чесно. Не тому, що вона моя сестра, е, а просто вона така людина. Ну, вона була дуже крута. Сестра в мене, так, була для мене прикладом. Багато в чому, до речі. Вона мені багато чого пояснювала, і у плані виховання мені здається, що вона навіть більше мені дала, аніж мама. 
Жаль. Мені дуже важко про це казати, бо то була моя така велика мрія, щоб ми збиралися з дітками усім, усією нашою родиною і святкували Різдво, або там хоча б, я не кажу дуже часто, раз, два рази на, на рік. То була така моя мрія, щоб дітки разом гралися, щоб от, вогонь горів, і всі так за столом, і ми разом, і щоб це було так тепло, я розумію, що цього вже ніколи не буде. Блін, я не можу. Мені треба, я не знаю, втікти. Фух. Короче, ну как я не хотела реветь. Ну просто одно дело, когда ты говоришь, какая она классная, другое дело, когда ты понимаешь и все. Я взагалі намагалась триматися якомога міцніше, коли це трапилося, бо я розуміла, що якщо я ще буду плакати, то мама взагалі здуріє. Я просто бажаю, щоб це, ця ситуація не лишалася просто так у повітрі, як випадок, бо люди мають нести відповідальність за свої вчинки. І кожен, хто винен, я вважаю, що винна не тільки одна людина тут, бо ми там не були, звісно, але як будуть докази, як по цій справі, то кожен, кожного, кого вдасться притягти до відповідальності, мають нести цю відповідальність. Бо це не тільки життя однієї людини, це ще здоров'я всієї родини і ментальне здоров'я мого повнінника. And this is the statement of Anatoly Androsevich, father of Helena Hutchins. The demise of my daughter Helena on the 21st of October 2021 became the tragedy and biggest bitter loss of my life, as well as the lives of my close loved ones. There is no way I can put into words to express the soul-crushing pain and suffering that I live through every day. The constant state of stress, the turmoil of my soul, have drained my physical strength and caused an abrupt decline of my health with continued physical pain in my heart. Every day I remember Helena. I remember the moments of our lives. Since she was a child, my Helena was a very curious and adventurous, hardworking, friendly, and caring person. At 11 years old, Helena convinced me to show her the nuclear submarine. We walked through each part of the nuclear submarine. As she grew up, it was her dream to make a documentary film about nuclear submarines with an emphasis on the threat of nuclear weapons for humanity. My Helena had a devoted and loving husband, Matthew, a wonderful son, Andros, and a profession she loved. In the most developed and democratic country, the USA, I could not have ever fathomed that her life would be endangered while she was at work. As a former Marine officer, I fully understand the responsible and correct way to handle firearms. I am confidently stating that the death of my daughter was caused by systematic gross violations of safety rules and regulations during filming of the movie Rust. I do not wish for revenge but believe that each person responsible for the death of my Helena needs to carry the punishment that is equal 
to their guilt. Maybe, just maybe, this might prevent the same type of tragedies in the future to others and spare other parents from such a heart-wrenching catastrophe. And now I would like to show the court very quickly just some photos. This, Your Honor, is a photo of Olga and Helena and Andros. Are you going to bring it up to me or did you want to put it on the... It's up to you. Oh, can you? Can you show it? No, Mo. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next photo is a photo of Svetlana and Helena. And the last photo, Your Honor, is Anatoly and his grandson, Andros. Thank you. And as was mentioned, this week, April 9th, was, would have been Helena's 45th birthday. In honor of her birthday, uh, our law firms have placed flowers on her grave at Hollywood Forever. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, we just have a brief uh, five-minute slideshow, and that will con that will conclude the state's presentation. Okay, um, we're going to have to do this a different way. Why don't we... Let me see what the best way is to handle this and put that. 
May I approach? Mm -hmm. How about we put it right here so you can see it? And I think that will work for that camera. And don't forget when you're when you get your cue. Okay. Um, space bar. We'll start the music. Let's mic it. And then arrow key will take you from slide to slide. Okay.
Your Honor, thank you. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, Ms. Gutierrez Reed has a statement she would like to, to the, tell the court. <clears throat> First and foremost, my heart aches for the Hutchins family and friends and colleagues as well. And it has since the day this tragedy occurred. Helena has been and always will be an inspiration to me. I understand she was taken too soon and I pray that you all find peace. I am beyond grateful that Joel survived that terrible day. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused and the old wounds that have been reopened. I am saddened by the way the media sensationalized our traumatic tragedy and portrayed me as a complete monster, which has actually been the total opposite of what's been in my heart. Your Honor, when I took on Rust, I was young and I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how to. Despite not having proper time, resources, and staffing, when things got tough, I just did my best to handle it. Today, I humbly ask you to consider probation, a probation where I can contribute to society through community service, and I can continue my counseling, and I welcome any classes that you may deem necessary for me to attend. I give you my word now that I would strictly follow the rules and respect the parameters of that probation. I beg you, please don't give me more time. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god-awful tragedy, but that makes me a monster. That makes me human. Thank you. Thank you. Jenna and I believe Bill Reed would like to speak to the court this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Brief state, but uh, it's a horrible tragedy for that wonderful lady, Helena, to lose her life. Also, be a tragedy to put my daughter Hannah in the penitentiary for that. It's alleged she brought, uh, introduced live ammunition on the set. That's not true. Why would she? The two people responsible for whatever come on the set are the vendor and the property master who had to work for her. On that terrible day, they had Hannah off the set doing prop duties. And she asked him to please bring her back on when Mr. Bowman comes so he could do a final check on the gun and, and its instructions. They, they, they did not do that. If they had it, this horrible day would not have it. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the court. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and just briefly, Judge, I've, I've made most of my arguments in the written pleadings. And, Judge, it's uh, nobody in this courtroom could not be moved by what we just saw. The family, um, Helena's family, her friends, uh, it was a horrible tragedy. Um, there's no doubt about that. And it's a tragedy for everybody. There were a uh, number of lives changed, lost. Um, that day, her friends talked about that. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez. I, I just want the court to know primarily <coughs> that she has felt remorse. And maybe I've talked to her as much as, as anybody, at least on the legal side, Mrs. She's, she's broken down. She's had mental breakdowns. She said, if only, many, many, many times. And she's, it hasn't come out. It hasn't come out until today because of the legal proceedings and the system we have. But she has truly felt remorse, and I will tell the court that as an officer of the court that she has indicated that to me. This court has seen jail calls she's made. I, I would submit to this court that you could probably survey 100 people 
after something like this happens, uh, including everybody that participated in the trial, scrutinize all of our calls and pick out something bad that one of us said. Because, Your Honor, none of us are what we are on our best day, nor are we what we are on our worst day. And as Ms. Gutierrez said, she, she's human. She's flawed just like everybody else in this courtroom. We ask this court to consider um, fairness uh, in respect that this was a cascade of tragedy. Uh, as some of the speakers indicated, uh, there were multiple system failures uh, by multiple people. Some of those people have come before the court, as this court knows, and, and received uh, six-month misdemeanor probation. Uh, some have not been punished. Some have yet to come before the court. Um, at least one individual is going to be tried in July. And so I know this court has the responsibility to weigh all of that and to determine what is commensurate and fair, as one speaker said, for Ms. Gutierrez. And what, what does that mean in the scope of things and what, what has come before this court? And I'm asking the court to consider that. And also what probation might do for her in terms of rehabilitation, which is another goal of our system, Your Honor. Anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, so I've made some notes along the way, so if I refer to the notes and are not looking at tables, it's because I'm reading. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentations. Thank um, the friends and family of Helena uh, for presenting uh, their memories and their losses of Helena. There are really three choices for sentencing before me. Um, what the defense wants is a conditional discharge. This means straight probation, unless Ms. Reed, Ms. Gutierrez comes back on a probation violation. She won't have a felony conviction on her record, so she can continue to possess firearms. <clears throat> Again, unless she comes back on a probation violation and receives the imposition of the probated sentence. The second one has not been offered by counsel, but uh, I've certainly thought of it, and it's uh, to continue her in the Santa Fe County Detention Center, that would be for 12 months, that's all she's allowed to stay at the detention center, and then put her on probation for the rest of the time. She's facing 18 months, she's got pre-sentence confinement for about a month or so. Um, in, in this scenario, she won't experience prison, she will be a convicted felon, she cannot carry a firearm under federal law and for a specific time under New Mexico law. And then there's prison, and uh, the state has proposed at 85% of the time uh, sentenced to incarceration based on the uh, serious violent offense statute. For all the fanfare and pundits and finger pointing that has been going on for over two years, we were able to seat a jury of her peers who confirmed they could listen to the evidence received in court and determine the facts and apply the law. They found Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter. What were some of the poignant facts that came out during the trial? In her police interview, she proudly owned her position as armorer. On October 21st, 2021, chaos ended after the film crew walked off. Ms. Hutchins and others were trying to rig, if you will, how they were going to keep filming. And what was the defendant doing while waiting? She was loading Alec Baldwin's gun. Did she have enough time to load the weapon safely? Plenty. Did she load the weapon? Yes. With dummies in a live round. Did she check what she was loading? No. Why? Well, in her own words, most recently, in her jail calls, she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. Did she check after that? No. And while you've heard her concerns about how she'll never work again as an armorer leading up to the trial, have her concerns changed? No. Here's what she says. This whole thing has been a character attack on her. Just recently in her allocution, I'm not a monster. And what did, oh, where is it? Uh, 
They talk about how much of Han on the phone, they're talk she and another, are talking about how much of Hannah's life that, uh, they could take up and that this is messing up her modeling career. This is while she's incarcerated waiting for a sentence. And what does she say about the death of Helena? Hannah is dismissive of the judge talking about someone dying as a result of her actions. Hannah says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. A conditional discharge is not appropriate. And the second option of leaving you in the detention center would be giving you a pass you do not deserve. I did not hear you take accountability in your allocution. You said you were sorry. You were sorry, but not you were sorry for what you did. You were sorry for and hope they can find peace. It was your attorney that had to tell the court that you were remorseful. The word remorse, a deep regret coming from a sense of guilt for past wrongs. That's not you. You're here by sentences follow stand. I am sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Miss Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. I'm going to ask the deputies to watch how the courtroom gets cleared. Please do an order of remand to the Transport order to the Department of Corrections and the judgment.